Actually, you know what I think would be best is if you could just tell a little bit um, about yourself because there's going to be a bunch of our viewers here that maybe haven't seen some of your stuff or read your book mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I think it would be best just to hear it from you because I don't think we'd be able to do your story justice. I know there is a, it's a massive story, but um, <clears throat> if you could just give it to us in, in a condensed piece, if that's at all a possible. Condensed piece. But yeah. what, what you're talking about, for those who don't know me, I was um, wrongly arrested, charged and convicted of a murder back in 1988 when I was 20 years old. Um, and I was dubbed one of the M25-3 gang. I was wrongly convicted of a murder in a series of robberies and I was sentenced to life imprisonment with no parole alongside two other guys. And it took me, and I spent... 12 years inside maximum security prisons here in the United Kingdom, fighting my wrongful conviction because I was wrongly convicted. And it took me 12 long years before the Court of Appeal finally recognised I was an innocent man and quashed my conviction and I was freed. When I came out of prison after those 12 years of being inside some of the UK's toughest prisons, I went on to become a journalist for the BBC, worked for the Today programme, Panorama, as an investigative journalist, spent a lot of time in my early career as an undercover journalist who grew a beard. I had dreadlocks at the time. I used to go undercover and expose criminality and corporate companies and, and things like that. And when I left the BBC four years ago, I, um, I got this gig on Netflix where I go inside some of the world's toughest prisons. Mm. And the series is called Inside the World's Toughest Prisons. Um, you think, you know, having spent 12 years trying to get the fuck out of prison, what am I doing? Willingly going back into prison. But I <laughs> did because I think what I do is really important. So in a nutshell, in a condensed form, that's me. 12 years in prison for a murder I didn't commit. Conviction quash went on to become a very successful journalist. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's Some safe to say that your your story is slightly more, I guess, dramatic than mine anyways. <laughs> um, but no, I'd, I'd love to just just briefly touch on um, the the story about you being wrongfully convicted, because I think, I mean, for me anyways, um, and I know it's actually my, my mom shares the exact same fear, and I don't know whether it's something that she spoke about, and now it's inherently been in my mind, but the idea of being falsely convicted or wrongly convicted has got to be up there in like a top top two top three biggest fears of all time and it wasn't like you were being convicted for you know something small here this was this was this was pretty serious and um you know the sentence was was heavy as well so i would just for me i can imagine that the the feeling of when of when that um verdict comes through and you you know that you are innocent and that everybody else has got it wrong must be a pretty pretty horrifying feeling it, what was know, that well, like it, it starts long before the conviction you know the arrest in the first place i mean i wasn't a, 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 an angel by any means as a teenager you know i got in trouble with the law quite a lot um, but nothing serious you know i say nothing serious violence as well as you know burglaries and things like that so I, i'd had my brushes with the law but when i was arrested and first interrogated and being accused of a murderer, I was quite cocky because I knew I didn't do it. And I thought, right, they got this wrong, all's good. Yeah. But as the interrogation went on and then the charge and then being put inside Brixton prison within a prison, so I was a sort of top security prisoner who was put inside a prison within a prison, not just any prison, but a prison inside a prison. And that's when it kind of dawns on you that you're in trouble, you know, at, at the serious level. So it starts really from the beginning, long before I went to trial, 18 months on remand, not convicted, waiting as the evidence started to, to materialise, you know, documentation, you start to read. I did in this cell where I was banged up for 23 hours a day, every day for 18 months, you know, only allowed out of my cell when two prison officers escorted me to go for a piss or shit because there's no toilets and stuff like that in the cells that I was kept in for many, many years. Um, but it's only when you start to read the documentation that you start to realise how bad the mistake is. Um, you, you know, being wrongly accused is one thing. Being wrongly accused of a crime you didn't commit 
is another thing. Being wrongly accused of a murder is, like you say, your your worst nightmare. But we all experience it in some way. When we're accused of something, you get angry about it, don't you? Mm. And even on a small scale, when you took something out of the fridge and you said it wasn't me, but then you're accused by your parents who said it was you, or they believe it was you, but you know it wasn't. Even those little moments, you can get really angry. So, you know, you've got to multiply this by a million times, and it it, it is terrifying. But I will say this. When, when you find yourself in a situation that you have no control over, you develop a mechanism within yourself to cope. There, there's no other way, is there? It's like any scenario you find yourself in. And I found myself in a scenario where my whole mentality, my whole persona changed to cope with being wrongly accused of murder. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, I feel as though it's, I mean, you, you mentioned there about being wrongly accused of like the smallest things and, you know, <laughs> memory. Yeah, I'm literally you... right now, I'm thinking of like all these little times that someone said I'd done something and, and I was, I was I, like genuinely annoyed well. that somebody had said that. And now, like I said, I just can't imagine what that, what that feeling was like. And w when you first then began your sentence, I guess, what was, w were you there almost again, still quite cocky at the fact that you, you, you were confident at this point you would get get out because the, the truth would prevail or did you almost like submit to to defeat that this was just you for the rest if, of your defeat life Defeat was never an option i suppose i shifted from this cocky 20 year old in a police station being accused of something and saying no gov it wasn't me you know i wasn't one of those no comment type suspects i was nope i was here i was doing this i was quite forthright if i remember you know when i was 20 saying it wasn't me and I think as I started to see the evidence in, in terms of the documentation, I started to see all the, the flaws and, and inconsistencies in the prosecution's case against me. That made me even more cocky, but more confident that at some point when I go to trial, a jury, 12 people who are supposed to be looking at this objectively would never convict me. And one element of my case, there was me. I had dreadlocked brown skin. Both of my co-defendants were black. The evidence clearly from the victims was that the perpetrators consisted of two white men and one black man, yet three black men were locked up in prison, accused and charged of these crimes. So when I saw that evidence, and I didn't know that until I started reading the documentation, even though it was a high-profile case, you know, front page of all the national newspapers in this country, news headlines on a daily basis. It wasn't until I see the doc documentation, you know, the statements of the victims who described the perpetrators, not just one victim, but three victims at three separate crimes described the descriptions of the perpetrators that didn't fit me and my co-defendants. Now, remember, this is 1988. You think about just a couple of years ago, George Floyd, I'm dealing with it back in 1988, racist police, etc. So, you know, seeing that document, I, I, I never felt defeated. In fact, what happened is I became more angry, I became more bitter, I became more determined to stand up for myself. And that's the kind of persona that I took on that helped me survive in all those years that I was in prison. You know, this bitter, angry, young 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 year old, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 year old, 31, 32 year old, all those years in those numbers I've just described, I was an angry and bitter young man fighting for my freedom. Wow. And at what point, because it's 12 years, like, is a massive portion mm. of your life. Like, all of my 20s. Exactly. I didn't see daylight. I couldn't, all of my yeah. 20s. Wow. Like, that's insane. And at what point did you start seeing the tables slightly turning for your appeal? Like, at what point was it a few years before your release? Was it? Yeah, it was, you know. I mean, in, in the years that I was in prison, as I say, I was an angry and bitter man. So I, I came up against the authorities on a regular basis, spent a lot of time in isolation and segregation, being punished for resisting the regime that mm -hmm. I shouldn't have been held in, you know, i.e., I shouldn't have been in prison, therefore I'm not conforming to the regime, i.e. as a convicted man you're supposed to do things that the system expects of you. You know, you go on anger management courses, you go on all sorts of courses, jump through all, all sorts of hoops, and I refuse to do any of that. And as a result, I'd get punished. So mm -hmm. I'd be fighting prison guards, I'd be fighting prisoners, I'd be fighting myself, you know, I'd be put in isolation, stripped, naked, bollock, beaten, black and blue by prison guards who, who, who I came up against. And that went on for years and years and years. And it was only in the 
I say 1999. I'd already had one appeal that was rejected. The court sent me back to prison to continue serving a life sentence. But it was in 1999, maybe just a couple of years before that, where journalists started to question the safety of my convictions. That's when the table turned because newspapers were then writing stories mm. saying, "Is this man innocent? Is his co-defendants innocent?" And at that point, you know, the prison officers, the screws, would slip these newspapers under my door that showed that even journalists were questioning the safety of my convictions because by now we had a big campaign going on outside the prison by people who supported me, my family in particular, but also campaigners. And they managed to get these kind of articles written questioning the safety of my co his, um, convictions, you know, asking questions, you know, is this man white? You know, obviously I'm not. I've got dreadlocks, brown eyes. <laughs> <Yeah>. The suspects <laughs> were white. So there were lots of questions. That was the turning point. Mm. That's when... The, the barbarity of, of my imprisonment started to ease, you know, the confrontation with prison guards relaxed a little bit because now they were saying, maybe he is innocent. All these years he's been protesting and we've been denying him. We now maybe believe what the journalists say. So that was a turning point. But it wasn't until 1999 when the European Court of Human Rights declared that I'd been denied the right to a fair trial in the British courts unanimously. 21 judges said denied the right to a fair trial and they insisted that the British court system relook at my case. Mm. We had a huge campaign and then the Criminal Case Review Commission, the body that oversees looking at wrongful convictions, also supported that stance and said that my case needed to go back to the Court of Appeal. So it was in 1999 and then 2000 when I was released. That was the turning point. And then obviously it came to the day that I guess you found out, or maybe it was over a couple of days, like the process of going through. You mentioned you got the appeal. Um, I listened uh, on a podcast that then you get taken back down to London and you go through that um, and you sort of came out, saw your family right there. And I, I, I think at that moment, did were your family always in the belief that you were innocent? Because I can imagine that almost hurts more than anything else if, if, is the fact that Maybe the family don't, your, your own family don't believe that you're innocent. And you mentioned that you'd come out and your younger sister was almost like your, I guess, biggest fan or biggest supporter, biggest advocate for your innocence. Um, how, was, how was that dynamic? I think in all the years that I was in prison, my family were very supportive. Three sisters who tried their utmost to make people aware of the fact that their young brother was in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And, and you know, their, their shouts fell on deaf ears. You know, sometimes they'd get some support. Sometimes some journalists would take an interest. Sometimes they'd do interviews on radio and TV if something dynamic was happening in the case. Um, but I think, you know, th their torment was probably worse than mine because they had to live with it on the outside and then they had to live with me on every visit asking for more help, putting them under a huge amount of pressure when they were unable to help me. They were unable to do anything legally yeah. to help me get my conviction overturned. So all they could offer was moral support, you know, and to promise me that they would go to the next big campaign meeting and try and mention my name or my case at that event where other campaigners were there. Um, but it was tormenting for, for them and for me uh, and painful. And we drifted apart, although my wrongful conviction and the campaign to free me kept us glued together on one mission. I grew up in prison, you know, at least those... 12 years, I become a different man altogether. They continued with their lives, you know, having children, trying to build their relationships. They still had this stigma circulating around their head like a cloud every day where their brother had been convicted of this notorious M25 murder, etc., that they had to live with all the time. I think they dealt with it very well. But yeah, it was when my conviction was, was quashed um, on the day that I walked out of the Court of Appeal. And it was at that moment that I fell into the arms of my sister, my youngest sister, who's one year older than me, but she's my youngest sister. Um, and all my bitter angerness kind of fell out of me as I cried my eyes out. You know, I didn't cry in all the years that I was in prison. I couldn't, even if I wanted to. But at that moment, it was as if the, the, the bitter anger twisted me, evaporated. You know, I wasn't going to allow the next 12 years of my life to be consumed by the 12 years that I just spent fighting for my freedom in, in prison. So they, they were my rock, if that's a yeah. kind of description while I was in prison, very supportive. And I don't think there was ever a moment, although they will never know, no one will ever really know, only those that committed the crime, myself 
and you, you know the victims that we were innocent you know my sisters believed me they knew i didn't do it um, but they were not there when the crimes were committed no one was apart from those who perpetrated those crimes they knew we were innocent i believe the police knew we were innocent um, but it's really tough for families really tough so just quickly is it, are the people that actually committed this crime but did did they, did they no. ever get found out or just no. nothing no. Still nothing alive. wow that's uh yeah that, that's that's pretty crazy and um i i guess from there on it began did you see it as like now my life begins once you'd come out from there because you've gone on to do these amazing things that we'll get we'll, we'll talk about in a minute but did you because I, I guess it's very easy to like you said hold that like bitterness towards the system and almost be like fuck the system i'm gonna now go and make it hell for them mm. um, because that's a way the way that a lot of prisoners that come yeah. out that turn but quite clearly that wasn't the route that you took and uh, how do you then go into where you are now Ob obviously you weren't you, you were you didn't do what you'd claim to do or sorry that you've been accused of doing so how how do you make that transition into into what you've done now it, it wasn't by design i yeah. it, it in the late years of my imprisonment i embarked on a journalism course and i only did that purely because i wanted journalists to write stories that i was innocent mm. so i needed to understand how journalism worked so that i could try and influence some of the stories where i could write letters to newspapers national newspapers or when i did interviews on television i had some understanding of how journalism worked to get my voice heard um, so that provided me with a skill set, a, a minimal skill set while I was in prison. So I manipulated that to get journalists to write stories. But when I got out of prison, there was no design, there was no desire, there was no ambition to do anything. You know, I was free and I didn't know what was going to happen next. You, you know, it's not like you have this euphoria moment where everybody's celebrating, you know, the bottles of champagne have popped. It lasts for two or three days, five days, and then people go back to work. And you're kind of left on your own again. It's like being in that cell all by yourself again. And then you have to try and find your way. For me, I was very fortunate that a lot of the journalists that I met during the years that I was in prison, at least in the last few years, who wrote stories or broadcast stories about my case. You know, documentaries were made on ITV, on the BBC and various other platforms and newspapers. So I reached out to some of those journalists and sort of... Um, got a tour of the BBC basically this is how my career started you know I met up with a guy who worked for Radio 5 Live at the old TV centre in White City he gave me a tour of the BBC centre and we went out the back of the studio for a cigarette and the then editor of the BBC Radio 4 programme a guy called Rod Liddell was outside there we got into a conversation and he offered me a job bang just like that no interview oh, no nothing that's pretty oh, cool yeah offered me a job. i was verbal <laughs> you know and i was you know you've got to remember when i come out of prison i spoke with a serious prison slang you know i don't speak <laughs> okay. don't speak anything like i do today you know prison slang southeast london and i couldn't articulate myself very well although you know when i met that guy he offered me a job there and then and that changed the trajectory of my life i had no desire or ambition to become a journalist or to work in that space at all i didn't know what i was going to do but it was in that moment that that guy gave me an opportunity and it changed the trajectory of my life forever and he must have seen something in that moment in me that he felt i mean there was a little bit of maverick about this guy here's this brown guy with dreadlocks out of prison yeah. who rubbed shoulders with the craze the kenny noise you know the goldfinger palmers all these kind of notorious criminals that we knew of and he saw an opportunity to get me to access them to do stories which everybody was into true crime so he had a motive but i didn't care 